Okay, we're, we're a little after the time we said we'd restart the next session. At the time, yeah. At the time, yep. Yeah, your clock is a little slower than mine. That's <laughs> One minute is not a problem here. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm the chair of this final session, uh, Programming AI Promise and Pitfalls. And we uh, have a, uh, we start with an invited talk and then we have two short talks and then we have a longer panel, summary panel that uh, hopefully we can, that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll contribute, continue the, some of the discussions that we've been having in the breaks in between. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started and let me uh, introduce Paul, Paul Tarot, who is gonna introduce the um, invited speaker here. Uh, thank you, David. So, uh... It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Norvig, uh, who is uh, uh, probably well known to everyone uh, based on the book and uh, um, a number of other uh, contribution, uh, ACM and uh, uh, AAAI uh, fellow, and uh, uh, also with uh, significant contributions at Google. But uh, my first contact with him actually was uh, when I uh, read about the Java's infrequently answered questions. And uh, the remarkable thing about infrequently asked questions, which I, I believe every language should have, is that uh, once you are fluent, you are not curious about the frequently asked questions. You are curious about the infrequently ones. And... Uh, uh, that was a delightful reading. So uh, uh, let me then uh, um, introduce uh, Peter and uh, hand the mic to him and uh, listen to his very interesting upcoming talk in which um, we will learn about uh, the next steps in the field. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I want to talk about uh, programming with machine learning. Uh, and one of the problems I faced uh, years ago is how to describe algorithms in a textbook so that students will easily understand them. And uh, I didn't want to dictate to the instructor what they should do, so I came up uh, with my own kind of uh, pseudocode and put that in the book and people seemed happy with that. Uh, then I wanted to implement that online. And it, since this was an AI book and the, uh, in the 90s, the language of AI was Lisp, uh, that's what I did. Uh, but I started to get complaints from students that they couldn't see the correspondence between the Lisp and the pseudocode, even though there was practically a one-to-one -one correspondence between the atoms. And I felt like this Steve Wright joke, if you can't hear me, it's because I'm in parentheses, right? <laughs> so there was something about Lisp and that there were just too many parentheses and the students turn off and they just couldn't get it. And so I learned that notation matters and I said, okay, this Lisp isn't gonna work. What should I use instead? Uh, at the time, Java was the most popular language. I looked at Java and I said, there's not a good match between Java and my pseudocode. So that wouldn't work. And so I started to look around for other languages and I found that somehow my pseudocode, I had uh, sort of channeled to Guido and I had almost invented Python in my pseudocode. And it was very easy to translate that into Python and uh, the students loved it, uh, they understood it uh, and everything worked well and I, and I moved on from there. Uh, and so I think that was a real lesson to me that to me, you know, whether I use Lisp or Python, that didn't matter too much. They're both languages that I that I got to be fluent in, but to to the students, it made a big difference. And so success in programming, I think, depends on some of these choices. Uh, so what is programming? Or if you know, I want to be more formal about it, uh, call it software engineering. And and to me, what I think is you get some description of a problem, you got some data, you have some team of humans that look at it. And you have some tools, a programming language, an interpreter, a methodology with uh, your testing methodology and your version control and so on. And then you come up with a, with a solution. 
And the, one of the real questions uh, for machine learning is who does what? How much is done by the, by the humans and how much is done by the computer? And so some of it is uh, describing the physics of the world, what, what's related to what. Some of it is describing the desired outcome, uh, gathering data. And then I guess one of the controversial parts is how much do you have to describe the steps, the solution? You know, if when we were programming an assembly language, it was kind of every single step. Then we got higher level languages that took away some of that. Your community has gone to this uh, uh, logic-based approach where the logical rules describe the physics of the world, but you don't have to describe in what steps the order, the, uh, the solution is gonna be arrived at. You just describe the constraints. And then an important part is how do you earn trust? How do people believe that this program is gonna work? And part of your community also uh, looks at uh, proofs of correctness, uh, but in the real world, that's turned out to be not that important. Uh, we can prove small things correct, and for things like uh, getting security right and so on, sometimes we actually do that. But for big programs, we never prove them correct, and it doesn't matter, right? So my trust in an operating system does not depend on the operating system being proved correct. And in fact, it's okay if it crashes occasionally, if it does it so in a way that doesn't disturb me too much. And so I have trust in the overall value rather than proof of correctness. And I think that's important. Okay, so in your, in your community, you've kind of defined software as a mathematical science and it's interested in logics and proofs. And there's a long tradition of that and it's really important and, and, uh, and I'm very interested in it as well. But I also see a change in that software it can also be looked at as an empirical or a natural science. And now we're dealing not with uh, logic, but with probability and with uncertainty and observations. And we do experiments and we, uh, we teach our machines uh, from examples rather than uh, going from first principles. And that's a change in how we look at things. So I'm interested in combining software engineering and machine learning. Uh, Arthur Z. Clarke is famous for saying any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You guys are logicians, so you're familiar with the idea of a contrapositive. So that's equivalent to saying any technology that's distinguishable from magic is insufficiently advanced. Uh, so how can we make uh, technology that's sufficiently advanced? Here's a uh, XKCD from 2014. This was talking about the way that engineers and product managers look at things. And sometimes the product manager doesn't know what's going on. So the product manager asks, can you make an app that will tell me when I'm in a national park? The engineer says, sure. And then says, and whether a photo is of a bird and the engineer says, yeah, I'll need five years of uh, research. Uh, and five years turned out to be about right. And in 2021, Here's a uh, YouTube video of someone uh, doing that uh, photo description of a bird in 60 seconds. Actually, down here it says it's 108 seconds, uh, uh, or one minute and eight seconds. Uh, and I think he cheated a little by fast forwarding a little bit somewhere in the video. But basically, in a couple minutes, we can now do that, what used to be a five year research project. So that's also, I think, really changed the way we look at what programming is. And now to really look at the difference between an, an AI problem and a traditional problem, uh, I wanna consider three applications. So one is we have a, a traditional kind of banking program, uh, getting all the accounts right. Second is playing chess, which is sort of old school AI. And third is a self-driving car. And I think uh, the hard part for traditional software is a complexity that there's millions of rules for when there's taxes, when there's fees, who has to pay what, and so on. Uh, whereas for machine learning, the problem is more that there's uncertainty. I hit the brakes in my self-driving car and the rules don't tell me exactly how long it's going to take to uh, stop. I know exactly what's gonna happen down to the penny when I make a transfer of accounts, but I don't know exactly uh, how the brakes are gonna react. So it's that uncertainty that makes it hard. And I've looked at sort of all these attributes and for the banking application, there's really only two things that are hard. Uh, the fact that there's software complexity, there's lots of deals, lots of rules to deal with, 
and that there's a uh, multi-agent. There's lots of people uh, making transactions, maybe at the same time, and there's concurrency type issues. For playing chess, uh, there's that multi-agent aspect. You have an opponent, there's sequential decision-making. Uh, you can't tell if your move you make right now is the right move until the end of the game. And there's the computational complexity that there's an exponentially large number of states to explore. But for the self-driving car, there's all these other things that have to deal with uncertainty in the world. The, the world's dynamic, it's continuous, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and so these types of, of problems are different, and maybe we need slightly different uh, software engineering techniques to deal with those problems. So my rough history of uh, AI or machine learning is uh, starting from the birth of the field up to around 2000, we said, well, what really matters is algorithms. And if you want to get a paper published, you wanted to get tenure, you made some good, cool algorithms. Then around uh, 2000 or so, we said, uh, yeah, we need, still need the algorithms, but maybe what's the differentiating factor is, do we have enough data? And the era of big data arrived and more data uh, beat out better algorithms for, for getting better results. In the last couple of years, I think the, uh, emphasis has shifted again to say, yeah, yeah, we got the algorithms, we got the data, that's a given. But the really hard part is the objective function. What is it that we're trying to optimize? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What's fair? How do we trade off uh, preserving privacy versus giving better results? And how do we make sure uh, our, uh, our algorithm for making parole decisions is going to be fair to all subclasses of, of, uh, of subjects and so on. Uh, and so, so that's been a change too. And we've got lots of tools. We've got 50 years of experience in how to make tools to make algorithms better. We've got uh, decades for data. But we don't have so much for really describing what it is that we want when, uh, when that's kind of up in the air. And I think you know a lot of people say things like, "Oh, well, we don't want to use these neural nets because they're hard to interpret uh, because of the tool itself compared to, say, a flowchart from a traditional language." And partly that's true; uh, the neural nets are hard to interpret, but partly that's inherent in the problem that you're trying to solve, rather than in the tools themselves. Uh, here's an example that that showed how it's sort of everything is connected, and it's hard to get it all right. So uh, I was traveling and this alert came up on my phone that said, depart now for a rental, uh, return rental car to Logan Airport. And there was a handy map, uh, which was really great because uh, the location of the rental return had changed since uh, the last time I'd, I'd been there. So that was cool. And then I had to spoil it all by saying, time of travel, 23 minutes by bicycle. And there probably was some machine learning going on here because most of the time when I'm uh, 23 minutes away from something, I do prefer to travel by bicycle. But returning a rental car is not one of those things. And the machine learning uh, uh, learned from my behavior, but it wasn't able to read the title of this event, which said return rental car, and it didn't understand what that meant. And in order to do that, it's sort of, we have to have programs that understand everything uh, and that's different from, from traditional software engineering. Traditional software engineer doesn't think that uh, in order to pop up an alert on the phone at the right time and have a map that I have to understand what it means to return a rental car. So that's another change. So machine learning could help solve problems like that, but you get uh, articles like this in Wired that say the efforts to make text-based AI less racist and terrible and I don't know about you, but uh, it's not a good sign when your technology is being described as racist and terrible. Uh, so there are lots of technologies we can be using. And, and this is kind of an aside here. This isn't my main point, but you guys are the logic programming community. And maybe somewhat adjacent to you is this probabilistic programming community, which has kind of the same idea of we're going to describe relations rather than describe the step-by-step the -step solution, but we're going to do it with probability distributions rather than logic. Uh, and so I would have liked to have heard more about the intersection of your two communities, and uh, maybe you can do that next time around. What I am really interested in is the application of machine learning throughout the software engineering lifecycle. And mostly we think about it in terms of the, the, the development part. And we think of, can you use a neural net to uh, 
uh, to replace a piece of traditional code, or can we have uh, a neural net automatically write or autocomplete your code? Uh, and that's just one part of the process. Uh, and we see lots of examples of that. So here's some papers where we have machine learning algorithms to do garbage collection, branch prediction, data center optimization, uh, learning sorting, learning to hash, learning to do query optimization, and so on. So we can take all these things where, yes, a uh, human programmer could say, you give me the specification of what's going on, and I can give you the best garbage collection algorithm. But the problem is that the world changes. And uh, now you have a different set of circumstances, and now a different algorithm would be better. And yes, the analyst could come back in and, uh, and update and come up with the best algorithm for the current circumstances. But if the circumstances are always changing, uh, the only way that's feasible is if there's machine learning in the loop rather than having an analyst in the root loop every time the world changes. Now, uh, this concept is a little bit tricky here, but I said that we we like to throw in our neural nets uh, in uh, in step number three here in the software development phase. But in all these other phases, there's all these other documents going on uh, and we describe what's what's happening. Uh, and then they're read by the analyst and we come up with a solution. And one of the reasons why these neural net solutions are good is because they're uh, differentiable. So if it produces an output that's bad, I can look at the difference between what the output is, what it should have been, uh, discover where that error is, differentiate back and uh, correct the system. But I can only do that through this very small part of the system, uh, the part of the application, but not through the whole software development lifecycle. And I would like to be able to do that. I would like to be able to go back to this uh, design document and say, the world has changed. Let's propagate that change through that design document and then come out with what we should do next because I see this all the time as a problem, that I see like the user experience designers bring people into a lab and say, here's the best user interface according to what we've done. And I'm sure they made the right choice, but a year or two later, the world has changed and their assumptions were wrong and therefore their conclusions are wrong. And, and what they did is hidden away in this document that's not part of the code and somebody has to remember that the document there is revisited it, and that often doesn't happen. But if all those uh, documents were part of the artifact that went together to make the code, then we could do this end-to-end -end differentiation. And we could say the world has changed in this way. Now this user interface that was uh, the second best choice last time, now that becomes the best choice. So I hope we can do that through machine learning uh, to sort of close that loop to make the uh, differentiation and, and uh, the connection go all the way around the software life cycle. Okay, now the big question is, can we automatically write code? Uh, Edgar Dijkstra said in, in the discrete world of computing, there's no meaningful metric in which small changes and small effects go hand in hand and there never will be. I think what he's trying to get at is you change one bit in a program and there can be a huge change into what it does. And if he's right, then this idea of using neural nets is doomed because uh, they rely on this idea of gradient descent. You have uh, an error surface here and you make a small change to your parameters and then you minimize the amount of error and you keep on making those changes until you, you get to a good solution. Dykstra's saying uh, he doesn't think that could be done. Go back to uh, Arthur C. Clarke. He says, when a distinguished scientist says something is possible, he's right. When he says it's impossible, he's very probably wrong. And then Ken Thompson said, uh, when in doubt, use brute force. And it turns out our tensor processing units and our data centers, uh, they can do that. And, and maybe Dijkstra was right uh, during his lifetime, which, which ended, I think, about two decades ago. Uh, but the world has changed since then. And um, maybe with the computing power we have now, we can do what Dijkstra thought was impossible. Uh, so I asked Chris Peach, who teaches the intro class at Stanford, uh, how much can chat GBT and, and these other large language models, uh, how well can they do it exercises in your class? And he says they do 100% of them. There's absolutely no problem. They get them all right. And 
Maybe part of that is because they're really good. Maybe part of it is because the problems and the solutions are, are actually online and, and it may just be uh, kind of duplicating them rather than solving them. Uh, but it certainly has changed uh, the way we're gonna have to do instruction in CS and in, in all the other fields. So here's an example. So Alpha Code was, uh, was one of these systems where you can give it a, a problem description and there's kind of two parts of this description. So there's just sort of natural language English, and then there's uh, a little bit more formal. Here's uh, sample input and sample output, and it's asked to solve this problem. And this particular problem uh, says you're given two strings, S and T of uh, letters, and you're gonna try to type the string S one character at a time and try to produce the string T and the trick you can use is while you're typing a character of S, you, instead of typing one of the characters, you can press the backspace instead. And that will mean you won't get that character and you won't get the one before. So can you produce T from S with some substitutions of backspaces? And AlphaCode comes up with this program, uh, which gets the right answer. So that's pretty good, uh, pretty impressive, especially considering I had to read all that English, make sense of it. Uh, but I decided to do a code review. And so the first thing is, uh, well, explain the code. You know, if a human programmer wrote this, I'd say, you got to have some doc strings. You got to have some documentation of some kind. And then I'd say, uh, uh, well, you violated PEP8. Uh, uh, and maybe, maybe uh, Guido's smiling there a little bit, right? So uh, this, the formatting isn't quite right. Uh, then you use the variable t first to mean an integer and then to mean a string. That's uh, not wrong, but it's confusing. Uh, and then there's all these one letter variable names is, is uh, maybe also a little confusing. And then all 10 of these lines could be done in just these two lines. You're just saying uh, you're making a, a reverse list of the input. Uh, and then you use j to integrate iterate over characters when usually J is iterates over uh, integers. And then here's a really weird thing. Uh, so they create this uh, list, which you're gonna use as a stack called C. And whenever they pop something off of B, uh, they append it to C. And I could see why alpha code does this because it's got access to lots and lots of programs and lots of programs when you pop something off a stack, you want to store it someplace. And so it said, yeah, I better do that. And I've got A and B, so I'll invent a stack called C and I better store it there. But then if you look at the rest of the program, uh, it's a dead variable. You never use C again. So it, it had this idea that is a good idea to, to, uh, to store it, but it turned out it didn't need that and it didn't go back and correct that problem. Now, a peephole optimizer obviously could do that, uh, but alpha code didn't. Uh, so that's kind of strange. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, so here's a big thing. So uh, doing a pop from the end of a stack is a order one operation, but popping from the uh, first position of a stack is order N because you got to move everything else back down. So this idea of reversing the list, uh, they shouldn't have done that. Uh, they they could have been more efficient if they didn't reverse the list. Uh, and because of that, uh, these five lines here could be just uh, uh, replaced by one line. And, uh, and then furthermore, writing this as straight line code, you know, that's sort of common in these types of programming exercises, uh, but I would rather encapsulate it as a function so that I'd be able to test it better. So, so there's a lot going right here, but also a lot going wrong. Uh, and, what I would rather have, rather than something that just wrote this code for me and said, here's the answer, I wanna have something that has a conversation with me that answers the interesting things about this problem. So here were the questions to me. Uh, why are the input strings uh, converted to lists? Uh, and the answer is something like, uh, well, you can pop off, off a list in order one, whereas uh, strings are immutable, so you'd have to create uh, copies of the strings. Why are the list reversed? Well, it's better to start from the end uh, than from the, the start, but reversing them really wasn't the right way to do that. Uh, it is more efficient to work backwards 
but you don't have to reverse the list to do that. Uh, and then the program always accepts the source character. Uh, does this work with all inputs? It turns out it does, but it's not completely obvious. Uh, the program does not allow you to simulate hitting backspace two times in a row, which should be allowed with the input. Uh, and it turns out if you think more carefully about it, that's okay. Uh, you can, you can uh, answer all the problems you have to answer without hitting backspace twice in a row, uh, but that's not completely obvious and you want some proof of that. And so I, I have some further analysis of that. But the idea is, is we got the right answer to the program, but we didn't answer any of the interesting questions. We weren't able to, to ask alpha code why it made the decisions the way it did. And that's what I want from a programming assistant. Uh, so I'd rather see something like this here, sort of the straightforward implementation of the code. Uh, and then if I have this sort of breakthrough analysis, then I can make this uh, code uh, much more efficient. This is uh, uh, sort of an exponential tree. This is a, a greedy tree that, that goes uh, one step at a time. Uh, and I have to be able to show that it's reasonable to make that. Uh, or alternatively, uh, I'd like to see an iter iterative version as well. And maybe I'd like to be able to have the system automatically go back and, and forth between them. So could you take my recursive code and turn it into iterative code and vice versa? Can you profile the code and optimize the slow parts for me automatically? Can you take the uh, uh, updates uh, that create copies and automatically uh, change that so that it doesn't have to make copies? Can you write some tests for me to give me more confidence that it gets it right? Uh, so any role that an automated system can play in the conversation helps, but these are the parts of, of, uh, of the conversation I would like to have rather than to just have monolithic, here's the answer is a bunch of code. And if we look at, uh, at this uh, uh, Dreyfus's uh, skill model, where we go from being a novice to an expert, uh, I'd say alpha code is kind of an advanced beginner and it's not a, uh, a staff or senior staff level engineer. It's not quite where I want it to be yet. Now, uh, this was an interesting paper uh, that came out in September about uh, natural language processing but I think it applies to writing code as well. And the idea here was we can, uh, it turns out we can prompt these uh, large language models by saying, uh, just by asking it, show, show your reasoning step-by-step step, and then they give better answers. You know, why couldn't they have thought of that themselves? Well, they don't, but if you tell them to go step-by-step, step, they give better answers. Uh, and so essentially they're learning something by uh, explicitly working through the steps, but then that's just part of the output and that doesn't, they don't update their own model to learn from that. And the idea in this paper is say, well, let's go ahead and do that. Let's train these systems to go step by step and then have them memorize the steps. And it's as if they were uh, uh, moving up the skill level, right? So, uh, you know, a novice says, I can only apply the rules that I know, and I have to think about each rule one by one. But an expert says, uh, yes, I internalized those rules so well that now I can just jump directly from the problem to the solution. Uh, and I think we could have the, the ability to train our models to do that kind of reasoning and to learn from their own reasoning. Here's uh, another example. So this is not programming, this is answering uh, math problems. And so uh, the question is here, a triangle has sides measuring one unit and three units. The length of the third side is an integer value. What is the length of the third side? And the system Minerva comes up with an approach that looks pretty good at the start, says the uh, sum of the lengths of any two sides of the triangle must be greater than the length of the third size. Uh, that uh, we must have one plus three greater than x, one plus x greater than three, and x plus three is greater than one, which gives us uh, these three equations. Uh, but it gets this one wrong. One plus three is greater than x is not greater than, not equivalent to x is greater than minus two. It's, it's equivalent to x is less than four. And since it made that mistake, uh, it then goes on and says, uh, since any sum of any two sides of triangle must be less than the third size. Uh, so 
it, it made a mistake and then it just hallucinated something that would allow it to recover from making that mistake. And it really reminds me of uh, The Wizard of Oz where Scarecrow gets his brain and says the sum of the squares of any two sides and Zosley's triangle is equivalent to the square of the remaining side, which sounds really impressive, but is completely wrong. Uh, and so that's what Minerva is doing here. So it gets the right answer. Uh, it has sort of half of the right reasoning, uh, but didn't get the rest of the right reasoning. And I think part of the problem here is that we run these systems by saying, uh, you know, they're probabilistic. So we run them multiple times and then we have them vote on the answer. And so it's more likely to get the right answer uh, because of the voting, right? So you run it 10 times, it comes up with three as the answer seven times. It says, okay, I'm pretty sure three is the answer. Uh, but each of the reasoning steps, there might be uh, different bugs in different runs of the reasoning steps and doesn't have a good way of combining the reasoning. Instead, they just say, okay, we'll pick out one representative set of reasoning. And though even though it has a bug on it, it arrived at the majority answer. What I really wanna be able to do is take, uh, you know, all seven or eight of those uh, answers and combine them in a way and notice uh, when there's errors in the reasoning as well as, as in the final answer. Uh, and, you know, with these systems, you ask for something like that. And if you wait another month, it'll probably come out, right? So the progress in the field is uh, so much faster. You used to have to wait a year or two for new results to come out. Now, probably next month, somebody will, will uh, put all this together. Uh, here's another example. So uh, this is uh, maybe in, interacts well with your community. Uh, you probably know the Isabel theorem prover. And so this is saying, can we take a uh, input, which is a mix of natural language and mathematical notation and translate it into this formal, formal theorem prover and then let it do its thing. So I think that's interesting because I think the job of a mathematician is uh, partially fully formal of uh, being able to carry out a proof and partially informal about being able to understand language and communicate with each other. And this is saying uh, we want the AI system, the machine learning large language model to do one of those parts and then let the theorem prover do the rest of the part. Uh, and that's a good way, I think, of having a partnership. Here's another example of uh, solving math problems. And this one I think is interesting because they chose to use uh, Python as uh, an intermediate language. And you didn't have to do that, right? Because these are not uh, really programming problems. These are math problems. Uh, but they say the way we're gonna solve these math programs uh, is to translate into Python, run that and get the answer and then generate an explanation by reading the Python program and kind of explaining what it does. And I think that's really interesting uh, because you, know, you could have just done that directly with having some sort of mathematical representation as the intermediate language. But by choosing a programming language that has a compiler, it means uh, you're less likely to make mistakes in that intermediate representation. Uh, yeah, you can still have the wrong program, uh, but at least they can automatically check whether it's a program that compiles and runs. Uh, and I, I think that idea of having some uh, kind of formalism in the middle rather than letting the middle representation just be a billion parameters of a neural net, uh, I think that's a really interesting idea and has helped them make good progress. Uh, then one of the questions that always comes up is, well, will all our jobs as programmers be automated away or will new jobs be created? Turns out there's this new job of AI prompt engineer. And when you type that in, uh, there's lots of, uh, of job offerings. Uh, I don't know if that's how long lived that's going to be, but I do believe that there will always be a partnership of our, uh, our automated systems do part of the work for us and the, our, the human analysts do, do the rest of the work. Uh, I think this idea of prompts is interesting. It's another sort of language in which to program in. And there's been debate back and forth. So Gary Marcus, well known as an AI critic, 
uh, says, uh, your system can't distinguish a horse riding an astronaut from an astronaut riding a horse. You ask for either one of those, and it always puts the astronaut on the horse. Uh, and you can sort of see what's going on here is that the system saying, uh, yeah, yada, yada, you ask me something, 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 horse, astronaut. Okay, I'll make a picture with those two. And, uh, and I know that people ride on horses and not vice versa. So that's the picture I'll make. Essentially, that's the level of understanding it has. Um, but it turns out uh, you can distinguish that, but you just have to be slightly more careful with the prompt. So if you say horse on the back of an astronaut, uh, it gets that right. Or you could say horse on the shoulders of an astronaut, it gets that right. Uh, but the original words for some reason didn't work. And so figuring out what the bounds are of what's going to work and what doesn't work, I think that's interesting. Uh, here's another one. Uh, it says a painting of a waterfall, you get some paintings. Uh, and then uh, this researcher here experimented with uh, saying a very beautiful painting and then very, very, and then very, very, very. And this picked out uh, 22 varies. Uh, and I guess they're more beautiful. Uh, you know, maybe that's just they're more uh, 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 saturation going on. Uh, but it's interesting to explore what you can do and what makes a difference. And then, so I wanted to end with, I think the future is going to be software engineers partnering with uh, neural networks or some sort of, uh, of machine learning system. And I asked for a drawing of that and, and that we're not quite there yet. So we still got work to do. So let me stop there. Uh, I've lost track of time, but we'll see where we are and uh, open it up for questions or discussion. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for uh, one question. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I wonder what you see as the role of compositionality and hierarchical abstraction in all of this. Uh, and then I'll just make a side remark that your vision of a conversation with an assistant to create programming actually is very similar to the programmer's apprentice from yeah. 35 years ago of, of Howie Schrobe and then carried forward by Chuck Rich and Dick Waters. Uh, right. But of course the techniques that you would use, and, and that was based on hierarchical structuring of, the, of, of idioms. Uh, but of course the techniques now would be completely different, but I'd be interested to know what you think about yeah, I remember the, the programmer's apprentice, and I was, I was certainly struck by it then, and uh, you know, actually spent a little bit of time playing around with that, and, and then concluded in the 1980s uh, that the technology wasn't there yet. So I think that was the right conclusion, um, and maybe it is there now. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're right, and, and this is a problem uh, for machine learning in general, not just for machine learning of programs. Uh, that they're not good at making these abstractions. And I think they're, they're good at what was missing from abstractions, right? So, uh, you know, uh, AI started out by saying, uh, we're really just doing logic. Uh, and then they said, uh, well, now we need a, a few little tweaks. Uh, so, you know, you can't quite say uh, birds fly. You, you have to say most birds fly. And then we need these kind of non-montonic type stuff. And that was part of the problem. But I think a bigger problem was uh, logic assumed that you can define all your predicates. You define what a bird is and, uh, and everything else. Uh, and that works great for uh, mathematical type concepts. Uh, you can define what a triangle is. Uh, but it doesn't match up well with uh, the natural world and with natural language that uh, we have uh, sort of constraints on what our concepts are, but we don't have definitions. Uh, and so it's hard to build abstractions on top of that. Uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, our formal languages were optimized to be able to take definitions and then build higher level abstractions. And our neural nets were optimized to say, uh, 
we can come out with the right answer in a messy situation by just feeding things through all the way without making any abstractions. Uh, and I think you have a good point that I want to have the best of both, right? So I want there are situations where there are good abstractions, and they may not be 100% perfect, and there might be exceptions, but having them is an important part of making the solution uh, rather than trying to go direct uh, from the input to the output. Um, and so building systems that can do that, I, I think it's important, but I don't think uh, we know exactly how to do that yet. But it, but it's curious because the, the later, well, sometimes the early layers in, in the neural nets sort of discover interesting abstractions. Yeah, yeah so they certainly do. And uh, I guess I, I should try to understand that better now, right? So, it, so I, I mean, I understood like the vision models of uh, five years ago, and you could say, uh, okay, the first level, uh, they're picking out things like lines. And, uh, you know, the neurophysiologists got really excited because they said, hey, you know, uh, we've done brain scans of single cell recording, and we know that there's a cell that detects horizontal lines and another one that detects vertical lines. And, and your artificial neural network's doing the same thing. And that's cool. And then at the next level, like you showed a bunch of faces and it would say, here's some things that look like eyes. And then at the level after that, something that looks like a face and the level after that, something that looks like a, a whole body. Uh, so it was picking those things out and they were kind of uh, fuzzy and, you know, this one responds well to an eye, this one responds well to a cat, but they don't completely define them. Uh, but I think as our models got uh, bigger, they got better, but we lost this ability to go in and, and understand more clearly what's happening where. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe it's Gupta has a question. Maybe uh, we have uh, two minutes for it. So okay. yeah. So so what role does uh, common sense mm -hmm. reasoning play here? So could we ever take human out of the loop, or you think, or human will always be in the loop? Uh, so, so to me, I, I think, you know, the real issue is, can we build trust in these systems? And, uh, and that's, a, that's inherently a human question. And, and the more you have a human in the loop, the more I think it helps to build that trust. Uh, uh, you know, and I said, a, a big part of the problem is deciding what it is that you're trying to optimize. Mm -hmm. And what kind of trade-offs are you going to have? And uh, and these systems are good at saying, once you tell me an objective function, I can optimize it. But they aren't good at, at saying, what should that objective function be? And so I think there's going to continuously uh, be a role for for humans to try to uh, do that. So, so, so if you look at, for example, you know, autonomous vehicles, I mean, they they're not there yet. And autonomous vehicles, from what I understand, primarily use machine learning. But if we look at the way humans drive, we use, you know, our ears and eyes for sort of constructing the environment, and then we use reasoning to actually make driving decisions. Yeah. So, but, but pure, purely machine learning based approach could eventually get to autonomous driving is what I wonder. Yeah, so the, the systems as they exist today, they're, they're, I would say they're more of a mix of that. And they're, you know, they're very complicated systems in which they do have a lot of these rules uh, built in. And, uh, you know, and I remember uh, one of the engineers complaining, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't get our cars to take the uh, San Mateo Bridge and it would go all the way up to the Bay Bridge because we had programmed in a rule that you need a certain amount of room to get over over a certain number of lane changes. And the approach to the San Mateo Bridge just didn't have enough room to do that. And so then they had to go back and say, uh, well, if you can save so many miles on the road, then you can violate this rule by a little bit. Uh, and there's always gonna be those kinds of trade-offs and, and those are built in to these uh, systems, 
Uh, you have to build in the rules of the road and, and driver's handbook. Uh, even then you have to uh, put in exceptions, right? So in, in early versions of this, uh, you know, there's a rule of what do you do when you get to a four-way stop and whose turn is it to go next? If you follow the driver's handbook on that, you'll never get to go. Instead, you have to say, when it's almost my turn, I have to start inching out or else the other guys won't take me seriously. Uh, and so it's like, you know, you, know you, you have to program in, I'm going to violate the law in this way at this time or else I'll be able to get stuck. Uh, and so it is, a, is a, always a combination of uh, perception and, uh, and, and built in rule following. Maybe we should, that's, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we should sort of move on a little bit that that one that the four-way stop example if I can take half a second when I was a small child I remember my uncle who came from the south where they had a lot more four four-way stops than we did where I was living and so he said the way you have to do that is you come up to the four-way stop and if everybody's there it's a balance and swing is the way <laughs> it works with the dancing thing. So anyway yes 